Hi everyone, my name is Randy Morse. I'm the author of several best-selling books, including The Mountains of Canada, Canada the Mountains, Oregon the Coast, Darkness to the End of the Tunnel, and most recently, a forthcoming book called Man Up in Ten Lessons. And it's this book, Man Up, that has led me to want to make this brief video for you. I'm talking to you today from beautiful Caslow, British Columbia, a place I'm sure very few of you have ever heard of before, but I can assure you it's one of the most beautiful spots in the world. It's isolated, it's tucked between two towering ranges of peaks with a beautiful Norwegian fjord-like lake at its foot. And it is, among other things, the heliskiing capital of the known universe. It's a beautiful Friday today. I wish I could show you the glistening white peaks right outside the window of this, my office, where I intend to go play just as soon as I'm finished talking with you today. So as I mentioned earlier, the main reason for me making this video is the fact that I've written a new book called Man Up in Ten Lessons, and as you could probably imagine from the title, this is a book about and for men who for various reasons are dissatisfied with their lives. So this book is an attempt to lay out in ten easy to digest chapters things that men should be thinking of and things that men can do to help them create a happier, more content, more successful life for themselves. So having said that, because I've been working on this book and I've been working on it for some time, I've talked with, as you can imagine, a lot of men and continue to do so both live through talks but also online through various websites that I run and maintain. And so what I've done today is assemble some of the questions that some of these men have posed to me and I'm going to share those questions with you in a general sense and give you a very quick overview of my answers to those questions. Most of this stuff is covered in much greater detail in Man Up in Ten Lessons, which is available at your convenience right now from the author's, uh, that would be me, website, authorcloud.com. So I'm going to tackle five issues that men have raised with me, but I'm going to give you an initial tip that I think really supersedes all of them. And this is so simple, it's almost embarrassing for me to say it out loud, but I'm going to do it anyway. And that is simply this. You are in charge of your own life. What an amazing concept. It's not your boss, not your parents, not your wife, not your children, certainly not your pals. You are in charge of your life. Unless you fully understand this, unless you truly understand the implications of this, virtually everything else that I'm about to tell you will go in one ear and out the other. So just keep this in mind, the fact that men who understand that they are in charge of their lives are the men that you see all the time online and live and on television men who are wildly successful, who've made oodles of money, continue to do so, and apparently are having a great time as they do it. Those, I guarantee you, are men who completely, right down to their nerve endings, understand that they and no one else is in charge of their lives. So, there you go. That's my bonus tip just to start things off. But let me turn to the correspondence that I've received from lots of men. And I've distilled some of that correspondence into just a few questions and the tips from me that follow from them. The first revolves around the notion of bravery. Well, bravery is a concept that for many men back in the day was pretty well known. Most men at least aspired to lead a courageous life, or at the very least, most men understood that one of the biggest differentiators between ordinary men and extraordinary men was that the latter displayed some form of courage. Now, as I'm sure you know, there are actually 
at least two broad categories of courage, and the first is the one that we usually think of when we think of courage or bravery, and that's physical courage. Uh, one of the many things that I've done in my life is work as a professional mountain climbing guide. I've climbed all over the world. I've been involved in rescues. I've climbed in the Himalayas, some of the highest peaks in the world. I've almost died myself in the mountains. And in the course of doing that work, I've seen many displays of both cowardice on the one hand and physical bravery on the other. Another great example would be to hark back to those dark hours on September 11th, 2001, when New York City firefighters and policemen rushed into burning and soon tottering and collapsing buildings, knowing as they did so their lives were at risk. No one put a gun to their head and forced them to do this. Their behavior is obviously a collective example of physical courage. But the courage that I really want to talk with you about today isn't that kind of courage at all. Instead, it's the sort of inner courage, the ability to face our inner demons that so many men seem to grapple with. Mark Twain once pointed out, and I think very pivotally, that in fact courage is resistance to fear. He suggested that if you would show him a man who showed no fear in the face of danger, he would show you an idiot. And I think Mark Twain, as with so many of his commentaries, hit it right on the nail. The essence of courage is not the avoidance of fear, which is in fact impossible, but instead the facing up to fear. And most of us are not professional mountain guides. Most of you watching this right now are probably not in the active military, and even if you are, most of you are probably not, at least right now, in the line of fire. Most of you who are watching this are not policemen or firemen, and therefore facing the kinds of physical dangers that men with those kinds of jobs do face on a regular basis. But all of you are alive, I hope which means that each one of you faces on a daily basis a whole range of fears from I'm afraid that if I speak up in this meeting my boss is going to kick my butt right out of the room to I wish I could tell my wife I don't love her anymore and leave. I could go on, fill in the blanks. Those are the kinds of things that men face on a daily basis and largely fail to face up to. The result of that is that they lead unhappy lives. And as you'll hear later, I'm going to suggest that that's the biggest no-no there is. So my first tip to you is to stop blaming your circumstances on the shortcomings you see in your lives. In fact, as George Bernard Shaw once, once suggested, there's no such thing as circumstances. Successful people, people who are happy, people who are wealthy, people who are content, people who truly make a difference in the world around them and in their own lives first, tend to be men who understand that they shape the world around them. They shape their own lives. It harks back to my very first tip, only you can change your life. Well, in order to do that, you have to have the courage of your convictions. You have to understand that there are no circumstances. There are only situations that you shape yourself. You simply need to muster the courage to do so. So that's my first tip. Be courageous. Okay. The second issue that seems to come up quite often with men who I talk to is the question of truth or honesty. And let me be honest with you right now, truth seems to be something that many men have a little tiny bit of trouble with, if you know what I mean. So what is truth? Well, usually, of course, because we're verbal beings, we think of and even talk about speaking the truth. The fact is, of course, that truth is more than that. Truth is, in fact, the thoughts that lie behind our speech. 
And if we want to lead truthful lives, which is highly recommended, by the way, then we have to do more than simply trying to guard our speech. We need to go deeper into that deep place where most men fear to tread and really examine what it is we're feeling and to think about things like, is what I'm about to say something that actually resonates with who I know I really am? And equally importantly, is what I'm about to say going to reflect something that I truly feel and believe about the person with whom I'm speaking? Let's call that kind of speech relative truth, or even better, compassionate truth. To the extent that you can go through your day thinking before you speak, and when you do, th when you do think, Think about those two things that I just mentioned. Is what I'm about to say going to resonate with who I know I really am? Is it going to represent the person who I know myself to be? And at the same time, and here comes the compassion in this, is what I'm about to say going to accurately and fairly and compassionately reflect what I want to convey to the person with whom I'm speaking? If you can start practicing going through that thought process before speaking, you'll find yourself starting to say things that make you feel good and make the people who you're talking to and with feel good as well. This is a dynamite combination. I highly recommend it. So, truth. Tip number two. Be honest. Okay, the third issue that keeps cropping up all the time has to do with action or more often with most men, the failure to take action. I think of it with the catchphrase, don't just stand there, do something. If you want to be rich, if you want to be happy, if you want to be loved, you've got to do something about it, man. Most men are mostly talk and very little action. Look, let me give you an analogy. I'm from the state of Oregon. I'm from Eugene, Oregon, in fact, the home of the University of Oregon, Go Ducks, and a place referred to quite often as Tracktown, USA. So I'm going to use a track and field analogy here to talk a bit about action. Let's pretend that life is a track meet. I'm going to divide all of mankind slash men into three groups at that track meet of life, and I'm going to call these groups on your mark, get set, and go. Most men are get-on-your-mark men. If they're at the stadium, they may be wearing track clothes, they're wearing their sweats, they're moving around the infield, they're stretching, they're doing all those things that track and field athletes do before they compete. But that's all they ever do. If I'm in the stands watching this meet, I'm going to see these guys milling around the infield, doing their stretching, etc. And five hours later, when the meet is over, they're still there, they're still in the infield, that's all they do. Most men are, in fact, on your mark men. The next group, get set, is a much smaller group. Now, your get set men go a little further. They're the guys who are actually taking off their sweats, and they have running outfits underneath. They have Nike, remember I'm from Oregon, running shoes on. They move down to the track. They position their hands just so on the on the track surface, they stretch their legs back, they put their spikes into the blocks, they arch their backs, they look steely-eyed down the track, they look like they're ready to go. But for the get set man that I'm describing, apparently the gun never goes off because they never actually run the race. The final group are go men. This is an extremely small group. I hope many of you watching this video are, in fact, go men. I suspect if you're watching this video, you're at least a get set guy. Go men are running, in many cases, before the gun's actually gone off. They are pumping their arms. They're churning around the track. They're focused on the finish line. These guys don't just think about running the race. They don't just talk about running the race. They are running the race. In other words, these are men of action. 
that is who you want to be. You need to be a go guy. So, as some of these men have suggested with me, this is something that they find quite challenging. Um, I start my book, actually, with a quote from my favorite president, and I suspect perhaps one of yours as well, if you're a history buff as I am, Teddy Roosevelt. It's actually a quote uh, that starts chapter one of the book, which happens to be on courage. And let me just read a brief excerpt from it, if you'll just bear with me for a moment. Men who, at the best in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. You don't want to be a cold and timid soul. So if you don't, you've got to dare to act. So, why is it that so many men don't act? Well, I think one of the primary reasons is fear of failure. Fear of what people will say if we do try something, if we do act on one of our dreams or one of our beliefs, and we fall short. What will the world think? What will the world say? The reason so many of us are concerned about this is that so many of us have learned to equate what we do do with who we are. This is a big mistake. Here's a personal anecdote. One day some years ago I was involved in a charity golf tournament at Winged Foot, one of the great classic golf courses in America in New York. I hit a terrible drive off the first tee and subsequently hacked my way in to the first green. I was terrible. My caddy was a very large elderly man who, as I began to walk dejectedly from the first green to the second whole tee box, put his massive arm around my shoulder, steered me away from the group I was playing with, and whispered in my ear, Son, please tell me you play some other sport. Those words hit me like a sledgehammer. I felt even worse after that, and if possible, played even worse during the subsequent 17 rounds, and for months thereafter was in a funk, all because, I know this sounds stupid, but it's true, and I'll bet some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, I allowed this guy's words to underscore the fact that I was actually my game of golf. It took my brilliant wife to snap me out of it by simply pointing out the fact that I'm not my game of golf. I'm me, Randy Morse. I do many things. I golf. I ski. I climb. I play basketball. I paint. I write music. I perform. I write books. I help people publish. I help raise three kids. I am helping make life difficult for the parents of my two granddaughters because I know best how to raise them as well. There are all sorts of things I do. In part, all those things, I suppose, describe who I am, but there is much more to me, Randy Morse, than those things I do. So get out of the habit of allowing what you do, your job, your station in life, to define who you are, because if you do, it's going to greatly reduce the likelihood that when the opportunity arises, when your blood is up, that you'll take that step, that you'll take those actions necessary to move towards becoming a happier, more successful, more content man. So, as they say back in Tracktown, USA, just do it. Okay. The fourth thing that men have raised with me revolves around the fact that so many men apparently don't care very much for themselves. The topic we're talking about here, and I hesitate to say it out loud, it sounds so unmanly, but I'm going to anyway, is self-love. Uh, most of you, I suspect, were raised by parents who hammered into you constantly and incessantly the need to not be selfish. Don't be selfish was something of a mantra for a lot of us growing up. And I suspect what most of us actually heard as we processed those words 
through our little brains was don't be selfish meant really don't love yourself. As a result, most men never go down the path of examining who they are and why they should truly care for that person they are. It's far easier and less scary to just stay on the surface and operate blindly, never really understanding the fact that if we don't love ourselves, it's really quite impossible to love anyone else, at least fully and completely. It's completely impossible. So, since most of you are terrible at introspection, I'm going to make a suggestion here, and it's the following. Every now and again, if you can do it every day, fantastic. Close your eyes, or if you're commuting to work and you're driving, don't close your eyes, obviously, but, but let your mind flow a little bit and start imagining yourself as the terrifically successful, happy, content, make a difference kind of guy you know you actually are. It's certainly the person who you absolutely want to be and become. Really let your thoughts focus in in detail on that guy. What do you look like? What are you doing? See yourself on a stage standing before hundreds of adoring spectators leaping to their feet in a standing ovation, having hung on every single word of wisdom you've just laid upon them. See yourself floating like Scrooge McDuck in an inner tube on a pile of money in a room the size of Cowboys Stadium. Actually visualize yourself writing that $10 million check to the charity of your choice. Picture yourself in a chase lounge on a deck overlooking a beautiful pool, which in turn is overlooking the beautiful Caribbean, a beautiful woman at your side. Hear the surf. Smell the salt air. Reach over and actually touch her lightly bronzed arm. Visualize yourself as the person you know you are, as the person you want to be, as the person, here comes the word, you'd love to be. The more you do this, I guarantee you, the more the actual you is going to start coming into that state of being. And remember, at the end of the day, you can't love anyone else unless you love yourself first. Eric Fromm, the famous psychologist and psychoanalyst, put it this way, the problem in our society is not that we have too much selfishness, it's that we lack enough self-love. So there's my fourth tip. Love yourself. Lighten up. My fifth and last tip is the biggest and most important one. And it has to do with happiness. If there's a single problem that most of the men who I deal with seem to be grappling with, it's the fact that at the end of the day they are fundamentally unhappy. This is a big deal because like Aristotle and William James and the Dalai Lama, to name three of many, I take the position that the main reason you are here, the main reason I am here, the main reason we're all here, is to figure out how to become happy. And then, as Nike says, to just do that. Be happy. So, to the extent that we're not happy, our entire lives suffer. I know this seems obvious, but most of you don't behave as though you actually get it. So the first thing I would say to you is to realize that happiness is a strategy. It's not a tactic, it's a strategy. It's in fact the overarching strategy that should guide all your thoughts and behaviors and actions, which are all tactics, as you move through your lives. Let me put it this way. Um, many people equate lots of money with happiness. Well, let's take a look at the oft heard tale of the guy who goes into a 7-Eleven, buys a lottery ticket, and wins $10 million. Eighteen months later, he's flat broke out on the street, hasn't got a penny to his name. Is he happy? No. Was he happy when, the, when he won the money? Well, he probably thought he was. 
But the point is that happiness is not a tactic. Oh, I know, I'm going to make myself happy by going and buying a lottery ticket. No. Happiness is a strategy. So, I offer you the following tip. I'm just looking at some of the questions that some of these guys have sent in, and here's what I would say to you. This is something that I do as often as I think of it, which is sometimes not as often as I would wish. It's something that the late Steve Jobs did every day. Steve Jobs, every morning, would get up, go into the bathroom, and stare at himself in the mirror. And he would literally ask himself the following question. Was everything that I did yesterday, and is everything that I think I'm going to do today, making me happy? Did it make me happy? Is what I'm about to do likely to make me happy? And if the answer to those questions was no, or eh, not so much, then he made it his practice to consciously think about what he needed to do to change that reality. Because he recognized, as I'm telling you right now, the prime directive for him and for all of us is to be happy. So I challenge you to do the same thing. Do the Job's thing. Get up in the morning, go to bed at night, you're brushing your teeth, look in the mirror, and do a little retro look at your day. Let's say you're doing it in the evening. Are the things that you did during the day, were the things that you allowed to happen to you during the day, things that made you happy? And if the answer is no, what are you going to do about it? Because remember my first bonus tip, the only person who can change your life is you. And if your prime purpose is to be happy, and you're not, then you need to do what? You need to honestly assess the fact that you're not happy and truthfully analyze what you think you need to do to change that. You need to actually do something about it. You need to act. And you need to do all that in a way that's compassionately loving, first of all, to yourself. you got to go easy with yourself. And if you do all of those things, then I guarantee you, on a regular basis, I might add, you're going to start leading a happier life. And trust me when I tell you, a happy man is a successful man. A happy man, if this is part of what makes you happy, is a wealthy man. A happy man, if this is part of what makes you happy, is a contented man. A happy man, if this is one of the things that makes you happy, is a man who makes a difference in the world around him, with his family, with his friends, with everyone. So, there you go. There are five tips, plus a bonus, that I hope you'll find of some help as you move through your lives. I hope if you get a chance, you'll check out www.authorcloud.com, where you'll find some information about Man Up in 10 Lessons, which is going to be officially released in the spring of 2012. And I'll leave you with this final mantra that is my personal favorite. It's never so good that it couldn't be better. Make it so. Bye for now. This is Randy Morse. Thanks for watching.